Hello, everyone, and welcome to the National Spectrum Management Association's webinar series. Today, we are pleased as punch to uh, have Mitchell Lazarus as our main presenter on Spectrum in the Slide Rule. And uh, my name is Joseph Sondry. I'm president of NSMA. We also have a panel after Mitchell's presentation with Mitchell and with our past president, George Kaiser, and, and myself. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce Mitchell. So everyone, some of you know him. Uh, he's been in the industry for many years. Uh, uh, but as you can tell from his shirt, he's now retired. <laughs> um, Mitchell began his private life as an electrical engineer with a bachelor's degree from McGill University and a master's from MIT. And in those days, he carried a very big slide rule. Uh, he followed with a PhD in psychology and brain science, also from MIT and a much later law degree from Georgetown University. Having earned his living as an electrical engineer, psychology professor, education reformer, educational TV developer, and free, free, freelance writer, Mitchell eventually settled into a 35-year career as a telecommunications attorney, which he retired last December. Uh, and he spent a lot of time with us at NSMA and we highly regarded his opinion. As a lawyer uh, who understood the engineering, Mitchell specialized in working with the FCC to bring new spectrum-based technologies to the market. His projects included, and were not limited to, uh, airport body scanners, high-speed Wi-Fi, RFID, um, implanted medical devices, ultra-wideband, surveillance robots, wireless microphones, wristwatch locator beacons, 3D printers, uh, building security systems, broadband over power line systems, several kinds of, of radar, and many, many more. He also first represented the fixed wireless industry, uh, the fixed wireless uh, communications coalition and other elements in the industry for uh, 22 years. Um, when the work required spectrum related calculations, uh, Mitchell still used the same slide rule from his engineering days. We'll hear a lot more about that today. Uh, Mitchell has a long list of nonfiction publications. Of there, the most widely distributed and the least read is the uh, government warning label <laughs> uh, on alcohol beverage packaging. So when you're, uh, you're drinking heavily, think of Mitchell. Um, he recently published his first novel. Uh, Mitchell's been a regular speaker for the National Spectrum Management Association's annual meetings for many years, well appreciated, and is the recipient of our 2015 NSMA Fellow Award for lifetime achievement and introducing to you, Mitchell Lazarus. Welcome aboard, Mitchell. We are glad to have you here today. Thank you, Joe. I'm gonna share my screen and put the slides up so I can change slides from here. Um, I can't see anybody. So if you wanna cue me with something, please do it over the audio. Um, NSMA. Um, here is a very brief overview of where we're going to go today, the topics we're going to discuss. I'm going to start with a very brief, very brief history of slide rules. These are the major events in development of slide rules. Uh, two names might be familiar. Isaac Newton, you may have heard of. He had some other contributions. And a second to last name, Peter Roger, same individual who invented the reference work called a thesaurus, where you look up the meaning and find the word. Um, he invented log-log scales in 1815, which nobody needed in 1815, and they were forgotten, had to be reinvented 100 years later when electrical engineers began needing these scales. Um, 1859, a man named Mannheim organized the scales on the slide rule into the form shown in the illustration, which will be familiar to you because every entry-level slide rule since then has used these scales and even the complicated slide rules. Um, Mitchell, these Mitchell, scales uh, uh, Joe, go ahead. I apologize. Um, it looks like uh, you, you're able to see this, the slides on your screen, but I'm not sure that they've- I have not shared them properly. Hang on a second. Give me a moment. Um, that better? There we go. And if you don't mind, just sort of cl clicking back through the first one so folks can see them. Yeah, I'd be glad to. Let me try and make this full screen. Yeah, they're on uh, They're on a full screen, at least here. So. Okay, there we go. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, here's the overview of uh, today's topics. 
Um, and here is the list I mentioned of um, events leading up to slide rules with Isaac Newton and Peter Roger mentioned. And lastly, um, Monsieur Mannheim, who standardized the slide rule into the form we use today. And this is the slide rule he used, and it's very similar to the ones that we still use today. Um, modern slide rules use these same scales plus, plus more. Before the Industrial Revolution, engineering uh, was actually pretty accomplished. You think about the big cathedrals and bridges and castles and so on, but it was done by trial and error, passed down from master to, to apprentice. If you're building a cathedral so many feet high, it had to be so many feet thick, and you knew that because your master told you that. And he knew it because 100 years ago, somebody built a cathedral that collapsed, and they learned from that, from that era. By the 19th century, um, engineers were beginning to understand forces and pressures and strength of materials enough that they could design not from past experience, but they could design from scientific principles, which required a lot of calculation, which drove a need for slide rules. Um, happily, the same precision mass production that made possible steam engines and such also made possible very accurate slide rules. So the Industrial Revolution required slide rules and also uh, made them made better ones possible. Some of the technologies designed using slide rules are listed here. Um, most of these are pretty familiar. Um, interestingly, the Apollo spacecraft were designed with slide rules and the lunar missions carried slide rules on board in case of computer failure. This particular one shown is Buzz Aldrin's that flew on Apollo 11. Uh, my first job as an engineer was designing computer components. The device was going to replace the slide rule. Um, and of course, we used slide rules to design computers back in the early days. Uh, take a short break for questions, comments. Joe, will you moderate this? Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, one question was, uh, going back to the Buzz Aldrin, uh, what what's a typical example of what he would have done if a computer had gone out with the slide rule? Uh, the big problem, a uh, number of big problems, but the biggest one was when to fire the retro rockets to begin the descent out of orbit, um, which would have had to be done on a slide rule if, if necessary. Uh, fortunately, the computers worked, so they never had to use the slide rule. Wow. And uh, and with the steam technology, what would what was an example there? Uh, making how big does a cylinder have to be? Um, what is the displacement required in order to generate so many horsepower of energy into the wheels of a train? Um, Carnot cycle, application to um, cylinder displacement, um, one big example. When electricity first came in, designing electric motors and generators required a lot of calculation and slide rules were used for those as well. Uh, so like if your load on the train was going up a slight incline, if you didn't have the right power, you're not, you're yes. not going to, okay. Yes, Perfect. and if the, if the uh, cylinders for the steam engine and the valving for the steam engine was not properly designed, you wouldn't get the power you need. Fantastic. All right. So that's a quick Q&A break and we'll, uh, we'll motor through to the next Q&A break and folks uh, feel free to keep adding questions to the chatter, question and answer. Thanks, Mitchell. Okay. Yeah. Um, how do slide rules work? Um, very briefly. If you have two rulers, ordinary rulers, you can use them to add. You set one ruler at two on the other, set the cursor on the top one at three and read off the answer is five. Um, terrific, except adding is easy. We want to be able to multiply. Uh, think back to high school math and logarithms, which I will not explain today. We might do a separate session on those later. But if you add the logarithms of two numbers, the result is the logarithm of their product. So we use the adding technology from the rulers plus logarithms and multiply. Um, in this example, we set the index of one slide rule at logarithm of two, and then we set the cursor at the logarithm of three, and we read off the result logarithm of six. To make that much easier, we relabel the rulers and we put the numbers where the logarithms used to be. So now we simply set one slide rule at two, set the cursor at three, and read the result at six. Um, and all the other scales work in pretty much the same way. 
general purpose slide rules came in simple and complicated. The simple ones were basically the Mannheim design that we saw earlier and the capabilities are listed on the slide. Uh, later people added other scales for cube cube groups, um, log and um, exponent, trig functions and so on. The illustration is a basic slide rule with all of those functions included. And if you had one of these, and you had also a big complicated one, you can actually do 99% of your work on this one. Um, it really had almost everything you need. Some calculations might take a little longer, but everything you needed was there on that slide rule. But of course, being engineers, we had to have the biggest and the best. Uh, <laughs> the uh, more complicated slide rules, an example here is shown, had the additional functions listed on, on this slide including if you look at the at the picture in the bottom right, those LL scales, those are Peter Roger's log log scales reinvented for modern, modern slide rules. Circular slide rules, they were fun to play with, but they never really caught on. And I think the main reason is that the inner scales are necessarily short. And because they're short, they give low precision. So the big slide rules could give you a full precision on all the scales and the circular ones, full precision only on a few scales. And uh, they never became, you know, we all had one and played with it, but they, ne they never became that, that popular. Special purpose slide rules were some of the first ones ever made. 1677, um, think back to technology then, it was kind of primitive, but, um, Man invented a slide rule for the purpose of calculating amounts of timber. You had a pile of timber, you wanted to know the length, area, volume for construction purposes, or you're building a building and you wanted to know how many trees you have to cut down for get the wood you need for the building. Um, slide rule would help you do that quickly and easily. Stayed in use for 200 years um, up to the late 19th century. Another um, early slide rule was used for taxing alcohol. You'd have a barrel and barrels came in different shapes. You'd want to be able to calculate the volume. Different kinds of ale or spirits had different alcohol content and you would use the slide rule to calculate the tax on that barrel of, of spirits or ale. The illustration is actually one of these early slide rules, uh, 18th century version, but still in use in the 18th century for taxing alcohol. Um, later special purpose slide rules tended to be either, at, we see at the bottom left, a general purpose slide rule with added scales. Uh, George is going to talk about this particular one in detail a little later, so I won't linger on it. And also some special purpose slide rules were dedicated devices used only for that one purpose. If you were ever a student pilot, you probably used something like the one on the right for calculating aircraft operations, and those are still still in use today. And another break, Joe. So um, on the slide rule uh, uses with the um, uh, going back to the the, the, the lumber in this in the, in the steam industry, was there uh, a, a actual uh, like the the uh, I guess the question was related around did were the royal measurements or you know often in those those areas and ages, there were royal dispensations granted and royal uh, uh, you know, monopolies granted. Was, was that actually like the government sanctioned measurement system? The, the government assigned the tax rate on alcohol. Um, and that, that's really all I know about this. This is not uh, something I've looked into all that deeply. The other problem, with, which I did not mention before, is that there are many measurement systems in use. The, the imperial system of gallons, courts, and so on is only one of many systems in use at the time. So the slide rules also had to allow for which system of units that particular part of the country was using for taxation at that time. So there was an easy, or it was the nexus or the equivalent of a Rosetta Stone for translating between other, other measures? Yes. Yeah. yes, well put. Yeah. Well put, thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, uh, I got one other question before we get to uh, leave the break uh, from Rick Fleeter. Uh, he, he noted that the Jepson's uh, circular uh, pilot slide rule was used to calculate sine and cosine to know how much crosswind you would have on landing or a headwind component to calculate your ground speed along a 
a given track, given a certain wind speed and compass direction. So he wanted to add that. I don't know if you have any comments on that. Yeah. Hey, Rick. Yeah. So that was just sort of a, a an added uh, a bonus information from Rick, <laughs> and and, uh, and we can uh, we can move back uh, to the and we'll have more Q and A later. But, but yeah, cool. Cool. thanks. Um, inevitably, uh, people compared slide rules to calculators, and calculators came out. Uh, speed is about the same. Slide rules are faster on some operations. We'll talk about that. The calculators, and I just see a terrible typo. You will all please ignore. Um, calculators boasted they had all these significant figures, all these places in the result. But in fact, for most engineering purposes, uh, three places that slide rules delivered was really all you need. If the end result is where to drill a hole or what resistor to pull out of the box, uh, three places are plenty for most applications. Um, the last line I want to mention, slide rules uh, produced error in long calculations. You would get a slight deviation from the exact precise result because of misreading or missetting. Um, calculators uh, didn't have error, but they did have a mistake. If you punched the wrong key in a calculator, you could get a grossly wrong answer. But it was often very hard to tell in a long calculation if the answer was obviously wrong because it wasn't obvious. Um, so they're both subject to their own, um, their own possible mishaps. One of the reasons that slide rules, I think, have fallen out of use is anybody doing science back in, in 19th century, early 20th century, became very adept at reading scales like the one at the top left. You learn to interpolate on scales, um, which is a natural for setting and reading slide rules. It's the same process. But when metering became digital and people lost the facility for reading those kinds of scales, calculators became a natural um, application. And the skill for setting and reading slide rules, I think, is, is lost or in decline because people just don't use those kinds of meters anymore and don't set machinery using knobs anymore. Now it's all digital, like a setting a microwave. A uh, few sample applications for slide rules, um, radio and spectrum applications. Uh, DB scale does what slide rules do in that it converts multiplication to subtraction, uh, to addition rather, and converts division to subtraction. Uh, this is a made up length budget that the, the radio engineers will laugh at, but the numbers work for me. You would always in practice use the right side of this table, you would add and subtract dBs in a link budget. The left side for comparison shows the multiplication and division of the equivalent numbers. So you don't need a slide rule for this kind of calculation, except that the numbers that you start with are often not in dBs, they're often in watts or something else. And the end result in dBm, you might want to have back in, in watts, milliwatts, microwatts. And the slide rule is a very quick and easy way to convert from the left side to the right side of this table to get into and out of the DB calculation. Other applications, um, inverse square law is a natural, goes very quickly and easily on a slide rule. Um, if you're doing um, quarter wave, half wave antennas, you need the wavelength given the frequency, very simple calculation. If you're doing a lot of these, you can do these on the slide rule very, very quickly. Uh, engineering students will remember this these equations and we'll cringe. These RLC calculations are truly nasty on a calculator. If you have a programmable calculator, that's one way to handle them, but otherwise they're just, uh, they're just a bear. Slide rule, actually, if you're used to it and you have one of the big slide rules, these actually go pretty fast and pretty easily. And it's the instrument of choice for doing these kinds of calculations. Again, especially if you have many of them to do. If you have a very simple calculation and have to do it repetitively, slide rules are natural. Um, I once had a list of 40 tower separations in miles. They had to be in kilometers. Well, you set the slide and the slide rule to the conversion factor, move the cursor back and forth, and you can um, calculate these as fast as you can write them down. Uh, finding harmonics, if you have a list of frequencies and you want to know if any of your harmonics are going to land in a radio astronomy band, um, again, goes very quickly, very easily. In my own work, 
as a as an FCC lawyer, I did a lot of Part 15 work, and the the uh, emissions limits in the FCC rules are specified in volts per meter at some number of meters, which is useless unless you're a test engineer. Everybody else wants the result in watts. The formula for the conversion is there. Uh, slide rules do this very quickly. If you have a lot of these at the same distance, then you just change the E squared and a slide rule goes through uh, these uh, very easily, very fast. There are extrapolation factors in the FCC rules for taking measurements at distances other than that specified in the rule. These are in, given in so many dB per decade. And for that, you want to change your power limit to a dB number. Again, uh, slide rule does the whole thing very quickly. Uh, peak and average limits are different in the FCC rules. Part 97 gives everything in, in peak envelope power. Again, these conversions go back and forth very easily in, on the slide rule. There's one FCC rule has the limits in millibots per square centimeter. You get that to ERP again very quickly with the slide rule. Um, wrapping up this portion of the presentation, the end of slide rules came with electronic scientific calculators. The first one um, gets a lot of attention, the HP 35, set in 1972, but it cost $400. And in 1972, that was like $2,500 in today's numbers, 10 times the price of a slide rule. So um, nobody actually got to use these every day in their daily work. Uh, just they cost too much. But then four years, just four years later, just four years later, the TI-30 did the same thing, um, but it undersold slide rules, 25 bucks. Um, so everybody bought them. And a couple of years after that, if you were caught using a slide rule, you looked like an old fogey, just didn't know what you were doing. So calculators pretty much took over. Although, as I note in the slide, uh, slide rules do have some dedicated users, some of whom are on the, the seminar today, and some of these applications that they still do better than, than calculators. Um, brief commercial break, I want to sell something here. Um, this is the novel that Joe mentioned up at the beginning. It's a story about how the first atomic bombs were designed and built in the 1940s. No computers then, and the book has a lot of slide rules and people using a lot of slide rules. Um, the book is rated on Amazon, and there are two five-star reviews by two different spectrum experts by coincidence, so you can trust them. Um, if you're interested in the book, and I hope you are, search on Amazon for Lazarus Implosion Method, and that cover will, will come right up. End of the end of commercial. Um, a few resources on slide rules, and this slide will be available on the NSMA website, so you don't have to scribble it down now. You can pick it up later if, if interested. And that concludes my remarks. I'll take any any further questions. Great. A um, uh, couple of questions. Uh, one, uh, actually, a couple of comments. One, uh, Andrew Clegg from uh, Google was mentioning one that's slide rules don't need batteries, so they're uh, they're an environmentally <laughs> friendly tool for the future. Um, and also, he said the novel is excellent, scientifically accurate, and also a great story. So, right, thank you. Get a plug from Andrew. Um, one question that came across was, I guess, in less than two weeks, we'll be hitting the 119th anniversary of the first wireless test by uh, Marconi. And uh, apparently, the landing place was Signal Hill in St. John's, Newfoundland. And it disproved uh, a lot of the critics, uh, one, uh, stating that... Uh, wireless transmissions couldn't go that far into, they couldn't uh, uh, even land properly due to curvature of the earth and a variety of other uh, aspects. So the questions were, how were slide rules used, you know, in December 12, 1901 by Marconi to, uh, obviously this is pre-calculator world, uh, and do you have any way to, to, to sort of answer how, you know, the type of microwave transition was, was actually put together and, and calculated out by Marconi using, like, presumably he used slide rule or some similar method. Well, it's a wonderful question. I, I wish I had something to contribute to an answer, but I really don't. Um, presumably, <laughs> he was using vacuum tube technology, and he would have used slide rules to design the transmitter and receiver to pick the resistors, capacitors, and so on. Some of the calculations that we saw on an earlier slide. But except for that, that um, supposition, I really have no hard information. 
be a fascinating topic for a future seminar. Yeah. How would you just sort of off the cuff, how would you uh, calculate for curvature of the earth with that? Was that a... Um... Well, the curvature of the earth has been known since Eratosthenes in 400 BC. It's a, not a hard trick problem to uh, take the distance you want to cover and see what the curvature would be for that distance. So some basic trigonometry, basic yeah. uh, uh, Pythagorean theorem uh, calculus. Yeah. Of course, I guess in those days, people did not know about the heaviside layer, did not know that radio waves would be reflected back to the Earth. So it would have been a, a valid objection, I think, until it was tried and proved to actually work. Okay, and we have an anonymous attendee also contributing that uh, this was probably pre-vacuum tube and there was something called spark gap technology. That, 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 is, that, is, that is true. Yeah. Uh, I stand corrected, but the receivers, I think, I mean, people use crystal receivers in those days that did not need amplification, but to pick up a signal over that distance, uh, you probably would have needed some form of application. Again, I totally guesswork on my part. Yeah, no, appreciate it. Um, okay. Um, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll hold off on the additional Q&A till, till we get to the end of the, uh, the panel discussion. One, thank you, Mitchell, for that presentation. Obviously, please hang around for the panel discussion. As a, uh, as a setup to the panel discussion, I'd like to uh, reintroduce to our, our viewers who have been here before, our past president, George Kaiser, who's got a variety of, as Mitchell mentioned, uh, uh, microwave, uh, wireless-specific uh, related slide rule. Uh, tools and, and information. Uh, welcome, George, and love to hear from you. And uh, I don't know if you want us to click through the slides for you, if you want to click on your own. All right. I'll uh, click on my own. If you'll okay. just share my screen. Yeah. So I think uh, we'll have to have uh, Mitchell stop sharing and George start sharing. So we'll let that happen. There we go. All right. With a little luck, you can see the, see the screen now. You're up. Yeah. Okay, great. All right, well, I'd like to talk uh, to you just a little bit about specialized slide rules. Of course, we all know that uh, slide rules have been used uh, since the, the, the dark ages for engineering applications up until the 1970s. Most of the slide rules were the standard Mannheim design, but I'd like to talk a little bit about one of the specialized slide rules, the Collins radio microwave slide rule. Now that's not very well known, not many people have uh, one of these gadgets. Uh, the only reason I have one is I was working for Collins Radio up in Cedar Rapids back in the late 60s. Uh, when I wasn't uh, going to school, I was working uh, in some, the summers as an engineer for them, and, and all of their engineers had a, micro, had a Collins microwave slide rule, standard issue. So I still got mine. I haven't uh, used it very much uh, in the last uh, 20 or 30 years. But the basic idea of this slide rule was it would take care of many of the calculations that you had to do in microwave design. Back in the 60s, everything was analog. So there was a tremendous number of calculations uh, 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 related to noise loading and uh, noise conversions, conversions between um, Pico Watson, um, uh, Debrinko and things of that sort. So an awful lot of the slide rule specialization was taken up with uh, handling the analog calculations measurements that you went through. Also a number of those calculations were related to passive reflectors, which also have kind of fallen into, uh, into decline. I'll just go over a couple of the cases of uh, specialized uh, calculations on the slide rule that uh, we still do today. First of all, everybody uh, is going to want to know what uh, free space wavelength is. I show you the calcul I show you the formula at the top, and then I show you at the bottom how it was done on the calculator. You set your uh, your uh, frequency on the C scale over a specific symbol uh, embedded on the D scale, which you see if you can see on your screen is a is a lambda, which is a you know representing wavelength. Okay, you set your frequency over, over lambda, and then you go over and, uh, and you, you read uh, your wavelength over the index uh, back on the D scale. Free space loss, another very common calculation. Here you set your uh, frequency again over a specific symbol, a, a triangle called with set uh, uh, spelled out beneath it. 
you set your frequency on the um, on the A scale above the symbol on the B scale, then you move over uh, to the uh, distance on your D scale, and in this case, 30 miles, and you measure your free space loss on your C scale. Another, uh, another calculation was antenna gain and 3 dB bandwidth. Again, you, you set your A scale over a symbol on the B scale uh, and you set your frequency above that symbol, in this case, uh, for lower six gigahertz center frequency. Then you go over on the, on the B scale to the diameter of the antenna and you read above it on a couple of specialized scales, both the gain and the uh, 3 dB bandwidth. So it's a very simple way to, to calculate your antenna gain. Nice. So these were just some examples of things that you would do for an L zone clearance. Here's a, here again, you would set uh, your, you would use the C and D scales to set up the calculation. And then you would read the center. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, you would set up the, the scale on uh, A and B, and then you would read the, the distance at the center of the path off the D scale above a, above a, a first Fresnel zone symbol. Can't see it very easily, but you've also got a six tenths first Fresnel zone, three tenths first Fresnel zone, all of those, all those symbols are available. So you could read any of those center of the path distances from the, uh, from the slide rule. Then you'd have to perform another calculation to figure out the uh, Fresnel distance along the path. The formula for that I've shown, shown down at the bottom. You can't do that easily on the slide rule. You have to perform your usual uh, multiplication square root functions to do that. There wasn't a, there wasn't a scale set up for that. But you could, uh, you could get your center center of the path, first Fresnel zone clearance or 6 tenths first Fresnel zone clearance very easily with this calculator. Unfortunately, uh, the slide rule has gone the way of the path, prof path uh, paper profile and the pocket protector, as well as Collins radio is, is long gone also. <laughs> so most people don't remember Collins and most people have never seen one of those specialized uh, uh, microwave calculators, uh, uh, slide rules rather, but they were very popular within the, the Collins group. And if you remember back in the 60s, that would have been very, very handy to have that because you had lots of different calculations to do and they were all, they all involved logarithms and multiplication. Great. Thank you, George. Uh, we'll, we'll, uh, 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 that's really useful information. Um, uh, and I think we'll, we'll jump into that a little bit when we have our, uh, our, uh, our, our panel discussion moving into the other piece of, of, uh, with, with Mitchell. Um, I'm about to share a screen. And I'm about to pull up. Uh, bear with me, folks. I'm trying to pull up uh, the next uh, few slides. I'm having a technical issue here. There we go. Can you guys see that screen? Yes. All right. So I'm just going to move on down. One thing before we move into the, uh, the final Q&A and panel discussion was to talk about uh, some precursors to the slide rule and some of its uh, foundational stones. And one of them uh, was the astrolabe. And I'll show you a picture of it right now. And, you know, the, the interesting part about the astrolabe was that as a, uh, you know, in the 10th century, uh, you know, literally a, uh, about a thousand, more than a thousand years after it, had, it started its, its use, its recorded use, there were over a thousand recorded uses for it, documented, you know, anything from a lot of uh, astronomical, astrological, and uh, and marine and other uh, other type of uh, of measurements. A lot of mariners used it to find latitude, height of the sun or stars above the horizon, and then using the star and planetary charts to uh, to understand, you know, where where they were and where they were headed off to. Also, in the religious world. Uh, 
there's a lot of documented uh, work with the astrolabe. For, for example, in the uh, Islamic religion, a lot of folks wanted to understand an astronomically, astronomically defined uh, prayer time. And it was an aid in finding the direction of Mecca, for example, Islam's holy city. Uh, the parts of the astrolabe are noted here. Uh, there's many different versions. Some are circular, some are pie shaped, some are the size of a basketball, some are handheld. It was uh, arguably the first uh, essentially pocket computer. Uh, it was ultimately replaced by the clock and sextant and uh, later, of course, uh, is a, was designed as a precursor to the slide rule. The folks who used it, it ranged widely from uh, uh, Claudius Potemeli, uh, a famous Greek astronomer, to Galileo, Christopher Columbus, a lot of religious uh, folks. Uh, modern day astrolab uh, researchers uh, are at Harvard, at NYU, at the uh, uh, the Royal Observatory in Greenwich, England. Um, so it's still, uh, it relates to present day. And that sort of brings us to the panel uh, uh, with George and uh, Mitchell. And the one of the first panel questions is from uh, Rick uh, Fleeter. And he wants to know, you know, are, are there still practical uses for slide rules and are people still practically using them? And I know some of these professors, as mentioned, uh, like John Huth and Alexander Jones and others that uh, uh, would have some answers, but uh, 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 we're also curious about our, our, our wireless experts, uh, George and Mitchell. What, what do you think are actual practical uses today that might be speedier, more efficient to use a slide rule? And I think this was mentioned a little bit earlier by Mitchell, but just to re-underline it. Um, any thoughts? Um, I'll go back to the, to the examples I gave earlier. Uh, those are the ones that, that I use slide rules for, and I know a few other people do as well. Wh whether slide rules will survive after the current generation of users fully retires um, is an open question. I don't know whether younger people are learning to use them or not. Uh, my son, for what it's worth, ran a nuclear reactor for several years and kept a slide rule on the control console and used it occasionally to the bafflement of his, of his, of his peers. <laughs> but I think that was my influence and not, uh, might not have happened otherwise. That's great. Um, and, and just to re-underline for folks who might not have caught when you first said it, I mean, people for like repetitive tasks, for emission limits, there were a variety of aspects that it's still, uh, if you're familiar with it, it's, it, you, it actually might be more efficient than uh, flipping up a laptop or whatever, or at least as efficient. Is that a fair is that an oversell or is that a fair assessment? No, it's a fair assessment if you know how to use the slide rule, but there is a learning curve and a lot of people aren't willing to undertake that, that learning curve. That actually relates to another question that came up, which was, uh, what is the learning curve for a typical college student, uh, both for actual, let's say, standard use, and then let's also answer that as in part two as for, let's say, microwave or other spectrum management use. What's, what's um, a reasonable yeah. time? Use? 10 minutes for the simple stuff and um, as, as many hours or years as you want to take. Uh, George, how, what's a learning curve on that call-in slide rule? Oh, that one was uh, pretty difficult. Uh, you had to learn all the set points. Uh, it was fairly complicated. I would say that it would take a, probably an hour or two to show you all the different set points to use on that because every process required a, a different setup. But once you got it, you could bang through those calculations very easily and much, much more easily than with any other methodology. I mean, back then, you know, you, you had adding machines which could add, subtract and multiply fairly well, but to do a division on an adding machine made the thing sound like it was gonna throw a gasket or something. It was uh, really difficult to do numerical calculations, uh, especially division back before you got it got a calculator and so everything that we did in microwave back then was you know it had a you know it had a logarithm or a multiplication in it uh, all the time now you could learn uh, the simple uh, multiplication division pretty quickly logarithms you could figure out a little faster but it took quite a while to figure out how to how to set the index where you set the 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 uh, the long part of the rule to the left or where you set it to the right and then how to handle the uh the exponentiation the the, the power of tens so those took a little that took a little more practice so you'd learn the basics in about five minutes you'd probably practice it uh, maybe for an hour and by then you'd be pretty good at it 
Well, that's, so that's that's not a that's not a big steep learning curve then. On no, somebody, it's not. Like, yeah. So that. But that, then today, most people, uh, you know, they use calculators for simple uh, one-off calculations, and you typically use a spreadsheet for all the more complicated mul uh, multiple pass calculations. So it's just uh, easier to throw things into a spreadsheet than drag out your calculator. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, James Wolfson uh, of XDOT is asking, uh, he has a Collins slide rule and he wants to know, <laughs> is there an instruction booklet available for it? Do we know if there's one or online or is there one, do you still have one that you can put on the website? Well, there is an instruction bullet, uh, booklet for it, but it doesn't cover any of the microwave calculations. I've got, I've still got my original uh, Collins slide rule as it came from the factory and there is no there are no instructions for doing the microwave calculations however uh, well i say that there are none in booklet form that what they gave you was a series of uh, of plastic strips that said if you want to do this calculation you read these these notes on the strip so it wasn't a manual in the usual sense it was uh, instructions on a on an add-in that was added to the calculator in fact, uh, I'll I'll go I'll I'll go drag those out. I'll walk away here for a second and show you what that is. That's that really is pretty unusual. Uh, most people have a manual, but back then they they didn't use a manual for the microwave calculations. Great. So he's. Uh... While he's gathering that, um, Rick Fleeter also mentioned, in addition, you know, some of the modern era benefits of the slide rule also include, you know, lack of dependence on batteries and electronics. I think we talked about batteries earlier, uh, but also the fact that they're radiation hard, uh, no recharge, easily made waterproof, that whole bit. Um, so those are, you know, in this day and age, there is, you know, quite a bit of uh, energy put around and a premium paid for whether you call it organic foods or uh, the tools that are uh, have a low carbon value, uh, don't require a lot of uh, energy or, or, or carbon usage to keep up. And I think that's another added element with uh, batteries or and or radiation uh, uh, um, uh, vulnerability. Uh, Rick also mentioned it's a little sad for Collins. He always wanted uh, um, some of their ham radio gear, I guess the S line, which he used back at Stanford Amateur Radio Club uh, in the 1970s. He also mentions a lot of shopkeepers are still using their abacuses, so in Asia in particular. Um, we'll give uh, George a little time to get his headset back on and, uh, and fill in. Um, uh, also for everyone who has a slide rule and they wanna share it uh, on the video of this call, uh, after the Q&A, uh, our, our, uh, our operator, uh, James McPherson, will uh, put on the screen anyone who wants to wave their slide roll, and it will be saved for posterity in, in, on our website. So uh, be ready with your slide rules for those of you who want to participate in that uh, once the Q&A is over. Uh, George, go ahead. Uh, you, you're... Okay. Well, you had the basic uh, instructions, you know, standard insert that you would expect, you know, for the various various functions, but these weren't microwave functions. They were just the log and multiplication and division, that kind of stuff. What you got that helped you with the microwave instructions were a series of plastic inserts that you put inside the, you had the, you know, you had the calculator case and the intent was you put these inside the calculator, inside the uh, slide rule case, and they would explain to you how to how to do the calculations, and they were microwave specific. Interesting. So and so you, you had a you had probably twenty different functions that you could do, and and they were covered on two of the you know <laughs> very very fine print on a couple of these uh, add-in. Uh, pieces of plastic and then for calculations related to antennas you had another series of of charts here that you would use either for figuring out gain for uh, periscope antennas which we don't use too much anymore and uh, and uh, 
uh, effects of noise loading and things like that. So these were the these were the gadgets that you used if you were doing microwave calculations. You didn't do you didn't use a standard standard manual. That's that's great information, George. Would you be willing to have us scan those and put them on the website next to this? Uh, we'll we'll be posting the PowerPoint in the video later. Would that is that something you'd be willing to let us? Uh, sure, you know, I, I can scan those. That would be that would be awesome. There are errors in a couple of them, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I'll let the I'll let you figure that out. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. Um, and uh, we had one more comment. Uh, there, uh, I guess some folks uh, wore these with their sport jackets in the 1970s, and uh, they thought they fit very handy in the uh, in their breast pocket. And uh, there's also a comment that the zero carbon footprint was is very handy in this day and age. So, um, so unless there's any other questions, uh, which I I think that we've run through those or comments. Uh, we'll leave it to James McPherson to try to share a screen for anyone who's willing to share their uh, their slide roll. Uh, uh, are you as are you in a position to do that, James? Or do I need to stop sharing anything? Or you got are you? Uh, and you're on mute. There we go. Yeah, if people raise their hands. I can promote them to panelists, and then they can activate their video. Can you tell people how to raise their hands for those who haven't figured it out? They just raise their hands on the screen or they have to push a button? Oh, there's Dennis. He's Everyone's figuring it out. Okay, good. <laughs> so, all right. So uh, while that's happening, uh, again, I, you know, uh, I, I guess I'll use this as part of the closing credits. And I really want to thank uh, uh, Mitchell and George for their, I mean, we're talking decades of experience, hard won experience. These gentlemen are literally top of the field in, uh, in microwave and wireless and spectrum management. And uh, we're, we're pleased as punch to have them here for NSMA's webinar series. This will be saved for posterity. And, um, you know, this is the kind of knowledge you can't, it's really hard, hard to, to, to recover uh, in books or online without uh, having uh, the tribal knowledge shared as well. So thank you, Mitchell. I think, uh, uh, Joe, I think Dennis is trying to show us something. All right, I Dennis, hold it. up this slide. Yeah, you can unmute if you want, Dennis, if you want to talk. Uh, and James has got, James Wolfson's already also up as well. Go ahead, Dennis. Okay, here's my um, slide rule from 1965 or 64. <laughs> I think that works out to be, what, 55 years ago or so. <laughs> <laughs> but who's counting? Yeah. Thank you for sharing that, Dennis. All right, and we got Joe uh, Caudelli, I think, about to share a slide rule. And uh, and uh, James, you got one? James Wolfson? Are you? Uh, there we go. Joe's got one. Well, I, I think I have the same one as Dennis, but I found this um, attached to the back of a, a picture that I inherited from my father. It was a picture of an alchemist. <laughs> oh wow how cool is that <laughs> well right very appropriate very well, thanks, appropriate. guys thank you joe thank you dennis does Jay everyone want to hold theirs up at once all right well one two three we'll hold that up this will be a good screenshot if we get everyone holding theirs up thank you thank you everybody uh really well done uh, appreciate your time and attention uh, uh stay tuned for more webinars from NSMA, the National Spectrum Management Association. We appreciate you all. Have a great day. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Yeah, thank you.